The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. Wow. God's riches, God's grace, God's deep love. Jesus describes as being like treasure hidden in a field. This weekend, thousands of people will have bought a lottery ticket. I've never bought a lottery ticket in my life uh, because I don't like to gamble uh, because of my Christian faith. I don't feel it's the right thing to do. Um, But, do you know, there's a lot of people who've just been wanting to make a discovery of lots and lots of money. And, And something like two or three people will have done that. But all the rest haven't. In this story that Jesus shares, it's likely that he was referring to something that had happened in the community in Palestine. People did use to hide money, gold coins and so on, in the fields, in the earth, keep it down so nobody knew because there wasn't the security in banks and places for money. And Jesus has got a crowd around him like I have. And he says, all that God's got for you, it's like treasure hidden in a field. And some ordinary guy, a labourer for a farmer, discovers this vast wealth hidden in the field. And when he discovers it, covers it all over, and he sells everything he has to then go in negotiation with the person who owns the field to be able to buy the field because the value of what's in the field is far more than the value of that patch of land. He's made the discovery and given everything to gain what there is in that place. And the similar story is of the pearl merchant, somebody who dealt in jewels and particularly specialised in pearls every day. And when this particular batch of pearls came in, there was just one that was totally perfect. It was outstanding. It was a remarkable, incredible pearl. And just like the agricultural labourer, but this man is far more wealthy because he's a jeweller, because he deals with valuable stuff. He pulls out all the plugs, he gets all the money so that he can purchase that pearl. Both these characters in the story that Jesus gives to us, that's recorded for us in Matthew's Gospel, have made an amazing discovery and decided to give everything because of that discovery. In the life of following Jesus Christ as a disciple... When we make the, because the greatest discovery we can make is Jesus. That's the greatest discovery of all. Once we have that engagement with Him, then we want to give all our lives to Him and to serve in Him. This isn't just a matter of faith where you nod at God, like you might just nod at someone as you're walking down Chapel Street. This is about a relationship. This is about something that's worth investing in with the rest of your life because it's so very, very wonderful. Oh, hallelujah for the wonder of the love of Jesus Christ. In my work, day by day, uh, I'm on trains, I'm meeting people in airports and stations, and if I get into a conversation with them, as I try to, I come to a point where I want to offer them A little cross. A little cross because this speaks of love. This speaks of something worth investing your life in. When I was in Wales on the market day, just as the market was folding up, there was a guy walking across the road who shouted me. He'd just been released from prison, I found out afterwards. Um, He wanted, he said, to experience forgiveness. And then he told me he'd been in prison. He wanted to tell me the crimes he'd done. I didn't want to hear. I said, no, you don't need to tell me. I'll pray with you and and we'll ask God for you to experience forgiveness. And uh, I placed the little cross on his hand. 
And I reminded him that when Jesus was nailed onto the cross, his words weren't a curse as the nails went through his hands for him to hang there and die. His words were a prayer to his father for those who were nailing him there. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And as that ex-prisoner held that cross in his hand, tears came down his face as suddenly he, he realised that in the cross was all love, was all pardon, was all forgiveness. You can tell I'm not Cornish, which I was, but I'm from Lancashire. And my mother's up there and she fell and broke her femur. And so I had to go and look after her. I'm an only child. And I also got to get down to Exeter for one of my meetings with uh, other people about where we're going to put our ministers in the following year. And it so happened that Virgin Trains, we're running a train from Preston, my mother lives in Lytham, uh, that I could get it just before six in the morning and I would get to Exeter St David's for quarter to eleven and therefore I could get to my meeting at eleven o'clock in Exeter, which is marvellous. And uh, the taxi woman said, you know, my taxi drivers are not too keen on getting up in the morning. Because I'd got to get up, at, at, I'd got to be, he was coming for me at half past four. That is pretty early, isn't it? And uh, so I waited, the taxi arrived, I jumped into the taxi, and you know, it stank of smoke. The taxi driver had been having a quick bag before he picked me up. And he was bleary-eyed, he was fed up, and I got in and shut the door and said, Good morning! And he could hardly say, <laughs> Good morning. So he drove away. And as we went along the road, he seemed to wake up a bit and he said, So what job do you do then? I thought, well, it's a bit obvious, really. <laughs> when I told him, I said I'm a sort of bishop, he said, you, You'll be interested in me. I've seen three miracles in my life. And he went on to tell me how his wife had left him, not much miracle in that, with three teenage boys... But he'd met another lady who had three teenage girls and her husband had left her and they got together and they were really happy. But then she discovered that she'd got cancer on the ovaries. He was heartbroken, he said. And took her to the hospital and the consultant did the examination and all the stuff that they have to do. And then he came back and said to them, I don't know how to tell you this. Yes, you've got cancer of the ovaries. But you're also three months pregnant. She's like, well, I'm, six, I'm, I'm, I'm 45. Well, there's a baby there. You're pregnant. First miracle. He said, and the curtains were around the bed in this hospital ward. He said, and the consultant said, I'll leave you on your own. And he walked out. And then he said, the consultant came back and said, by the way, there's three kings outside here. I want to come in and see them. <laughs> he said... When she got to six months, that's when they can operate on the cancer. And the baby's going to be all right. When they examined her, there was no cancer. The second miracle. He said, and then she's had a wonderful birth, and we were warned that the baby could have all sorts of things wrong with it. And I've got a wonderful son, and when we get to the station, I'll show you his photograph, because he's a fine little boy third miracle so I said let me tell you about the God of miracles that I serve because there's another miracle for you and I talked to him about the cross I talked to him about the miracle of and the, the great discovery that you can make in knowing Jesus Christ for yourself in experiencing this great love from the cross and when we got to Preston Station he showed me the picture I offered him the cross and he said to me, as a boys' brigade lad when I was 12, I made a pledge to Jesus, but I've not followed it through. I said, well, you can make that pledge now. And so I prayed with him, and he gave his life to Christ. You can do that. You can experience forgiveness, just as he did, because he just turned his back on God. And the Lord opened up all that love he met he, there was a new miracle in his life and he discovered 
something more wonderful than riches of lots and lots of money. Because the peace and contentment and love that we receive when we find Jesus is our friend and that he loves us and that we can centre our lives on his cross, that's worth more than gold. Our friends... Here in the open air, in this sunshine, with God's sun beaming upon us, we can rejoice together in the grace and love that flows from God to all people. If you'd like me to pray with you, if you'd like to take the cross, please just see me or Alistair at the end of this time when we've been singing, and we'll be very glad to pray with you and to talk with you. And... Uh, you can rely on God. You can't rely on my old gramophone. <laughs> but you can rely on God. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. And remember, this was the, the owner of a slave ship who, uh, who wrote this. When I was in West Africa with Elaine Horner, we saw the slave's house in one of the communities. We stood on the cobbles that the, 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 the people there had stood before they went into the boat. And he had been a very cruel, wicked man. But God's amazing grace transformed him. And it can transform you too. Let's sing Amazing Grace.